Turkey famously was neutral in the Second World War, although they declared war on Germany two months before the Germans capitulated. What if things went different in the Second World War and Turkey joined the Allies in 1940? Would this make the invasion of Yugoslavia and Bulgaria centering into the Axis more difficult? As a result, Romania also might not align with the German ultranationalist ideals. Let me show you what I came up with. Me and Wardat did a collaboration on this video, where he has uploaded a video regarding Turkey joining the Axis in the Second World War. Make sure to check it out after you're done watching this one. The Republic of Turkey was a state created from the ruins of the Ottoman Empire, which, alongside the Central Powers, was defeated by the Antant countries. Through an alliance with the Russian Bolsheviks, Republican-minded leader Mustafa Kemal managed to eliminate and push the Greek army back to the Balkan Peninsula, while the French were pushed back into Syria, which they subsequently began to administer as their own colony. The Great Powers finally decided to back down. The Treaty of Lausanne in 1923 finally demarcated Turkey's borders, while Armenian and Kurdish demands for independence were ignored. The occupation of Istanbul ended and the newly formed state did not have to pay any war reparations. Turkey became a republic and Mustafa Kemal became its first president. Mustafa Kemal greatly changed Turkey and the Turkish culture, making them more western. Let me share a couple of his reforms, as you can understand how Mustafa Kemal could join France and Britain. Atatürk was also a supporter of national Darwinism and held the opinion that only strong nations have the right to exist. This is also why he was greatly admired by the Austrian painter, but Atatürk refused to be compared to his admirer and considered it a grave insult. He declared, I led an enslaved nation to freedom, while Hitler enslaved a free nation. One of the most famous examples of Atatürk's reforms is that he banned men from wearing traditional faces. Mustafa Kemal was generally a public opponent of Islam and Sharia law. Another example of Mustafa Kemal's major reforms was the relocation of the capital city of Turkey from Istanbul to Ankara. The Turkish capital was not to be exposed to the attacks of foreign naval fleets. Something I find really interesting is that Turkey abolished the Islamic calendar, symbolically moving from the 14th to the 20th century. The calendar no longer began with the year of Muhammad's journey to Medina, but with the birth of Jesus Christ. In 1928, the Turkish president launched a major reform of the Turkish language. Instead of the then usual use of elite Ottoman Turkish, which was heavily influenced by Persian and Arabic, he introduced vernacular Turkish as the state language. Since then, the Turks also used a modified Latin script, with some added characters that replaced the Arabic one. Women got the same right to vote as men, which made Turkey several years ahead of such Western countries as France and Switzerland. So, as you can see, the Kemalist regime was very hostile to the German Reich, and if the Turkish president had lived a few years longer, it could have greatly influenced the events on the Eurasian continent during the Second World War. Just so you know, these are some videos that I'll be uploading in the near future. So, make sure to subscribe if any of them interests you. Now, back to the video. In this scenario, Atatürk will rule until the first half of the 1940s. This is possible due to him dying at the age of 57, which can be considered quite young. I do believe that we can extend his life for the duration of the Second World War. Mustafa Kemal died in late 1938 due to illness, but it was discovered that he had cirrhosis just one year prior to that. Mustafa Kemal already led Turkey for 14 years, so my line of thinking is that despite he was a heavy smoker and drinker, had he discovered his illness literally 10 years later, he should have lived longer. This may be slightly unrealistic, but it allows us for a more interesting scenario, so let's continue. Historically, in the late 1930s, he gradually began to mobilize and modernize his army, and began to cooperate heavily militarily with France, the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union. For example, under license, Turkish shipyards began producing Soviet cruisers, while factories began production of French modern fighters and British Matilda tanks. In this timeline, Atatürk would loudly condemn the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but on the other hand, he is aware that his army needs time to rearm. Until the capitulation of France, no significant changes take place except for the Turkish preparing for war. As the Kingdom of Italy declares war on Great Britain, the Republic of Turkey occupies Rhodes and the Dodecanese Islands in protest. The Italian Duce subsequently threatens Atatürk not to stick his nose into his conflict. The German Chancellor is a bit more conciliatory. In the summer, he offers him an invitation to Munich, which he declines in the following days, claiming that any non-aggression pact is out of the question under those circumstances. During January, the Turkish government tries at all costs to convince the King of Romania not to submit to the goals of the Axis at any cost. 
Finally, at the end of the same month, Mustafa Kemal, Greek leader Metaxis, Yugoslav region Paul and Romanian King Karol II meet in Istanbul, where the Balkan Pact, which was concluded in 1913 against Bulgaria, is renewed. In this pact, all participating representatives undertake not to submit to the interests of the Axis, and at the same time, the Bulgarian Tsar Boris III is ordered to end all cooperation with the Kingdom of Italy and the German Reich. At the beginning of the next month, a meeting with Vladislav Molotov will take place in Ankara, in which the Turkish government asks Stalin to give up his claims on Romanian Bessarabia, as it's necessary to keep the Kingdom of Romania strong in the event of an attack by neighboring Hungary and Germany. In late August, the German Reich gives ultimatum to Romania to surrender northern Transylvania to the Kingdom of Hungary. Karl II, on whose side the majority of the Balkan states now stand, decides not to submit. However, the German Chancellor wishes to get Romania on his side at all costs. As we know from history, his plan to get Mikolaj Horty on his side by handing over northern Transylvania to Hungary, which would later create discontent among far-right and ultra-nationalist factions in Romania, fought by a coup d'etat that would bring power to one of the ultra-nationalist leaders who would subsequently join the Axis in order to acquire Bessarabia and Transnistria. Now there is a grave danger that the Austrian painter won't get any of these states on his side. However, the German Chancellor wanted at least one of the already mentioned states to go over to the side of the Axis powers. So, he decides to hand over Slovakia to the Hungarians, thanks to which Mikolaj Horty becomes his ally. In doing so, however, they antagonize the Slovak ultra-nationalists, who now feel betrayed, which culminates in the uprising of 150,000 strong army armed with Czech Slovak tanks, artillery and fighters, which in the Slovak Tatras will switch to a guerrilla style of warfare, which will noticeably complicate German plans for the conquest of the Balkans and Eastern Europe. While the Germans and the Hungarians are trying to suppress the Slovak partisans, the Italians are trying to conquer Greece at the end of 1940 through Albania, which they already occupied by then. Atatürk responds to this by declaring war on Italy. As we know, historically, the Greeks managed to defend themselves against the Italian aggression even without the Turks, and even managed to occupy the southern part of Albania. This time, however, thanks to Turkish intervention, the Greeks managed to conquer all of Albania while they managed to capture several dozen Italian tanks, which then they repaired and incorporated into their army. Even in North Africa, the Italians do not succeed at all, that is, until Erwin Rommel helps out with the Africa Corps. In the spring of 1941, when most of Slovakia was already in the hand of the Axis, the Austrian painter and the Italian Duce launched an invasion of the Balkan Peninsula. However, the invasion takes place much more slowly and at the cost of greater losses. After losing all of Transylvania, the Romanians retreat to the Carpathians, where they take up defensive positions. Meanwhile, Slovenia, Croatia and Vojvodina are occupied by the Italian divisions. Meanwhile, the German Chancellor pressures the Bulgarian Tsar to join the invasion. However, Tsar Boris III still stubbornly refuses. Due to the fact that Albania is in the hands of the Kingdom of Greece, most of the troops of the Balkan Pact are concentrated in the Carpathians and the Dinaric Alps. An army of a bit less than 3 million defends a line stretching from Dubrovnik in Croatia to Bukovina in Galicia. In April, the German and Italian army is occupied Bosnia and Herzegovina, resulting in the creation of the puppet state of independent state of Croatia. Really quickly, I want to mention that I happen to have a banknote from this country. The independent state of Croatia didn't produce any coins of their own, as they briefly existed. But they did make banknotes, here is me showing one of these on the screen. Now, back to the video. Bulgaria, to which the Turkish president and other representatives of the Balkan Pact promised to hand over Greek Thrace, Serbian Macedonia and Romanian Dobruja, joins the side of the Balkan Pact. This may be a stretch, but I would assume that Bulgaria would receive at least one of these lands, with Serbian Dobruja being the most likely. The reason why Bulgaria will be awarded lands so they join the Entente is because the Balkan Pact is having trouble containing the Axis, who have already taken half of Yugoslavia and Romania. A Bulgarian entry into the site of the Axis could literally collapse the Balkan front, with the Germans occupying all of it. For the sake of this video, let's say that Bulgaria receives Macedonia and Southern Dobruja, and promises to never lay claim to any other lands outside of their territory, meaning that Greece gets to keep all of Thrace. The Bulgarian army was approximately the same size as the one of the Greeks, but unlike them, they had over 100 original Czechoslovak tanks, and several dozen Czechoslovak Avia B-534 fighter planes, and Tavia P-71 bombers. In addition, they also had dozens of German B-5-109 fighters and German DO-17 bombers. The situation is thus prolonged again and the Axis territorial gains only occur in May, when Western Banat, Serbia, Kosovo, Montenegro and Albania are conquered by the Wehrmacht. The Romanians, who hate the communists, realize that they cannot defend themselves forever without a Soviet intervention, 
So, representatives of the Romanian government meet Vyacheslav Molotov on the Crimean Peninsula, in which they offer him to hand over all of Bessarabia to the Soviet Union. In practice, however, this was a trap designed by Mustafa Kemal, who believed that a clash between the Wehrmacht and the Red Army would occur after the occupation of Bukovina and Moldova by the Axis Army. And this actually happened. While bombing oil fields, the Luftwaffe accidentally damaged several divisions of the Red Army occupying Bessarabia. The German Chancellor was unaware of the handover of Bessarabia to the Soviet Union. This all culminated in the cancellation of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. On June 22nd, the day the German army was supposed to enter the territory of the USSR, Stalin declares war on the Axis. This surprised the Austrian painter, since the Germans, together with the Hungarians, were forced to fight the Slovak army and subsequently the Slovak partisans, plus the slow occupation of the Western Balkans and the constant fight for the Romanian Carpathians, the Axis did not have any time to care for a plan Operation Barbarossa, and the German divisions were not in a such condition that they could effectively attack the Soviet Union. However, this does not mean that the German army was not dangerous and that the Red Army could defeat it so easily. During 1941, the Germans managed to conquer Moldavia, Western Ukraine and Western Belarus, plus Lithuania and Latvia south of the Daugava River. However, the Turkish army, the Greek army, the Bulgarian army, the Romanian army are defending Wallachia and the Serbian army is defending Macedonia. They are still successfully resisting German and Italian aggression. Thanks to this, already in 1942, the Wehrmacht finds itself into a situation as it was in 1944 historically, when it was gradually pushed back out of the territory of the Soviet Union. Above all, we must not forget that Finland this time wouldn't side with the Germans. This would allow for more Soviet divisions to conquer the West. While the desperate free French and British wait for the Americans to land in Africa, the Balkan countries, together with the Soviet Union, push the aggressors out of their territories. At the end of the same year, Africa Corps is pushed out of North Africa with the help of American divisions, while Stalin managed to conquer all the territories that fell to the Soviet Union during 1939 and 1940. At the beginning of 1943, all of Transylvania and most of Yugoslavia are liberated by the countries of the Balkan Pact. The Allies landed in Sicily and a civil war breaks out in Italy, like in our history. The Austrian painter, who considers the Soviet to be the number one enemy, decides to concentrate the vast majority of his army in Poland and Hungary, thanks to which the whole of Italy is liberated from the ultra-nationalist dictatorship at the end of the year. Vichy France, which in this alternate history has preserved its partial independence until now, decides to go over to the side of the Allies, thanks to which the whole of France was liberated in the spring of 1944. In the summer, with the support of the British, the countries of the Balkan Pact succeed in conquering Hungary and liberating Austria, while the Red Army, after a year of bloody fighting, finally succeeds in liberating most of Poland, including German Auschwitz. In the fall, American, French and British divisions occupy the Rhineland, while Canadian divisions distinguish themselves by successfully liberating Luxembourg, Belgium and the Netherlands. In the winter, after the difficult liberation of Czechoslovakia, the Red Army finally enters Prague. Most of the Wehrmacht is meanwhile pushed back beyond the Oder River. At the end of 1945, all of East Germany, including the city of Berlin, is in the hands of Stalin. The German Chancellor commits suicide just before the surrender of his army. The German Reich capitulates just before the beginning of spring, thanks to which the American President Franklin Roosevelt, who in our history died at the end of April of the same year, will live to see this victory. Thanks to the fact that the war ended two months earlier, the Potsdam Conference took place already in May 1945, when Winston Churchill was a still British Prime Minister. To understand this, in our history, the Potsdam Conference took place during the British elections, in which Winston Churchill was defeated by the rather pro-Soviet-minded Clement Attlee. Due to the fact that this conference takes place long before the British elections, Churchill is Prime Minister until the end of this conference, which makes it more difficult for Stalin in his planning for the organization of post-war Europe. In addition, the still alive Mustafa Kemal Ataturk participates in the discussion too, who in this alternate history only dies on the 10th of November 1945, only seven years later than in our history. The result of the conference were as follows. Turkey is allowed to keep roads and the Dodecanese islands. Cyprus will be divided between Greece and Turkey. Greece is allowed to keep all of Albania. All promised territories are annexed into the Tsardom of Bulgaria. The Kingdom of Yugoslavia gets Zara, the Eastern Peninsula, Western Slovenia and as compensation for Macedonia, the Trieste region, including the port city with the same name. Romania is restored with the same borders as they were in our history, without southern Dobruja and without all of Bessarabia. However, due to the fact that the Kingdom of Romania was never divided between Hungary, the Soviet Union and Bulgaria, and due to the fact that the Romanians never joined the Axis, the Communists have only minimal support, thanks to which the Kingdom of Romania remains an absolute monarchy. 
which after the death of King Carl II and the subsequent coronation of Michael I is transformed into a constitutional one. The so-called Danubian Confederation will be formed from Hungary, Austria and the South German states, exactly as Winston Churchill wished, who could not realize this dream in our history after losing those elections. Czechoslovakia will be restored as a democratic country, but with pro-Soviet government, just like in our history. Unfortunately, even Poland will not avoid 40 years of proletarian dictatorship. As for Germany, it would still be divided, but in a slightly different way than in our history. The eventual German Democratic Republic, which would become known as East Germany, would stretch from the western river side of the Oder River to the eastern river side of the Elbe. This means that the western borders of the pro-Soviet Germany will stretch from Dresden to Hamburg, or rather the border of Denmark. Since the Red Army liberated far fewer countries than in our history, I have no doubt that Stalin will somehow want to be compensated for this. So, in this alternate history, there will be a restoration of Denmark with pro-Soviet government, just like in the case of Czechoslovakia. Norway, the Benelux, France, West Germany, the Nubian Confederation and the Kingdom of Italy will be restored as countries with a pro-Allied government. The following future looks like this. Turkey becomes one of the founding members of NATO. There will be no civil war in Greece because it never capitulated. In Bulgaria, after the death of Tsar Boris III, his father Ferdinand I becomes the new Tsar. After his death in the late 1940s, a period of regency followed, which lasted until Simeon Saxe Burgotta becomes adult. Yugoslavia and Romania become constitutional monarchies, which join NATO together with Bulgaria and Greece in the late 1940s. The Danubian Confederation becomes a neutral state along the lines of Switzerland. During the 1950s, the country slowly began to prosper thanks to tourism and efficient agriculture. Czechoslovakia, East Germany and Poland become puppets of the Soviet Union at the end of the 1940s. After the death of the Danish king Christian X, the monarchy is overthrown and the communist dictatorship led by Axel Larsen is established. In response to this, the United Kingdom annexes the Faroe Islands, while the United States occupies Greenland. Italy, France, the whole countries and West Germany gradually stabilize economically. All of these states make this the best possible ending, in my opinion. On the other side of the coin, Wardat made a video on a similar topic, but this time Turkey joined the Axis, not the Allies. Check his video out if you want to watch more alternate history content.